and then we can discuss it. So right here is the first slide. He uh, um, included elevations and transit times for targets in this program. They're based on the location of Fort Wayne, Indiana. People in other locations will need to modify them to be accurate. Uh, I don't think anybody lives that far away. That would that be far. It would be that far off. Can you so run start, that in? Can you run that in like presentation mode or something? You know. What I'm um, I don't know. Uh, I think I'm not. I'm not familiar with this part of. I uh, I don't know. Maybe click on view. I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm click not on a what? power. Well, try click on view, but anybody that's good at PowerPoint can just hop in. Oh, here that. we go. View. Let's see here. Click on slideshow. I'm on slideshow. It doesn't give me a presentation version. I go over yeah, to, a, uh, we're on the second slide. Slideshow from beginning. Yeah, well, I can do icon that. The first down in the lower says, right corner next to the magnifying slider, just to the left of the minus sign. Oh, I see that. Yeah. Oh, I see that down That's there. It right there. Wow. Okay, there you go. There you go. Um, Excellent. All right, so at any rate, we'll run the program and if somebody wants to stop and discuss whatever's on the slide, say something and I'll see if I can figure out how to stop. All right, so let's see. Now I gotta figure out how to run the slideshow. Just click on the forward arrow on the lower left corner, I believe. This one? Yep. Great. Yeah. You gotta click again because that's a staging. Oh, or page down. Or oh, there we go. It. Oh yeah. Now you're runner. I'm not familiar with this version of. Uh, do I have to keep clicking, or is it gonna? No, no, it's gonna go. No, leave it alone. All right, start up in five, and why bother? By Dick Evans. Okay, well, I think everybody on here is experienced enough to know who Charles Messier is. And uh, he lived in the late 1700s to the early 1800s. And he got, he was a common hunter and he liked to, he was tired of seeing the same fuzzies over and over and over again. So he wrote the Messier catalog. So he wouldn't keep looking at the same stuff over and over. And it says it's got the many of the most interesting objects in the sky. Um, I think that's been kind of surpassed. There's a lot more in it, but at, at, in the range of amateur telescopes, that's probably the most interesting group. I think, Dick, all this stuff is in the Milky Way, isn't it? Yes. All of this stuff is in the Milky Way. So he's going to bring up some of the fun targets to investigate. All right, so here's the list of the targets that are in this program. Uh, M6, M7, M62, M22, M28, M8, M20, M21, M25, M23, 17, and 16. And some of them are down by Scorpius, which is kind of down on the uh, uh, horizon for us, and Sagittarius. Well, some of these I've never heard of. At least by the names that are in here. The flickering Goppler cluster, right triangle with Antares, and I guess that's pronounced way, and uh, southeast of Antares and a little bit north of way. So you see the drawing on the screen forms a, a obtuse triangle. And here's a nice picture of it. And it says it's an Ophiuchus.
magnitude 6.45, 22,200 light years distance, and mostly old stars tightly bound together by gravity. What and Stephen O'Meara says, what fascinates him is the core of M62 appears to flicker like a dying flame. Now, I've never noticed that. It's just 5,500 light years from the center of the Milky Way. And tied galactic tidal forces displays many of the cluster stars. And you can see the core, which is in the little circle down there, is no longer in the center. It has a very dense core, core consisting of at least 150,000 stars. And it's thought to be surrounding an intermediate mass black hole with a mass between 1,000 and 9,000 suns. But in further study, maybe when the new teles web telescope comes online, maybe they can define that a little farther. This, it's uh, composed of two distinct populations of stars from different episodes of star formation. And you can see kind of the different colored stars in there. And then, uh, as usual, the uh, second generation stars are surrounded by elements from the first generation. It's 11.78 billion years old, so it's pretty old. Considering the age of the universe, it's only 13.7 uh, billion, I think, at last count. And then that's the location of the M62 for those with computer telescopes. But if you're doing the star hopping, it should be fairly easy to find. And then Dick lists the trans transit time of midnight on June 17th. And then in June, late June, the constellation Scorp is creeping west. Okay, then if you're out looking at that one, you should go look at M17 and Scorpius. And the stinger star is called Shala, I pronounce that right. And then you go just three and a half, three degrees, 15 minutes to G Scorpi. And M17, or M7 is only uh, uh, a little bit north of that, two degrees. So you can find them in the finder view. And here's a picture of it. So that's uh, Ptolemy's cluster. The Greek first recorded it in cluster in 130 AD. It had pretty good eyeballs. 3.3 open cluster of 80 stars, 30 of which can be seen with the naked eye. But not with my naked eye. I can't see that well in the dark. And M7 is about 200 million years old. And open clusters that are much younger than globulars and form in the spiral arms of their host galaxy. And it's 980 light years from us. And I didn't know this, it's the southernmost Messier object. And there's the uh, location of, of it for the computer guys. But it should be fairly easy to find, although depending on the background stars, it may be difficult to you know, know what you're looking at. And it only gets 10 degrees above the horizon from June the 2nd to July the 28th. And that far down, the scene is never very good. You always get heat waves and stuff. All right, so he's inserting something here that otherwise you never learn about. Before the modern era, the constellation Scorpius is quite different. Um, that's true of a lot of them. And as you can see, that's the head and the, <coughs> head and the body, and the right claw and the left claw. And I don't think they do that anymore with the claws. Maybe they do. Okay. The right claw is alpha, beta, 
Libre, while the left claw is Eta Zeta Opiucus or Opiuci. They're declawed the great. That's what I thought. They don't show the claws anymore when you uh, see it. They don't show the uh, odd shaped head. All right, M6 butterfly cluster, Scorpius. Okay, you go to the tail of the, to the stinger. And then you go east to G Scorpia again. And then about uh, five, five uh, uh, degrees above these two in a Christmas tree pattern is uh, M6, the butterfly cluster. Now, uh, I don't really see the butterfly, but then again, look like three dimensional to me. Oh, yeah, okay, I see. Um, that'd be like the antennas or something. I don't see the three dimensional effect, but uh, uh, my eyes aren't that good either. But it should be fairly, the stars look fairly bright. Oh, 4.2 is this open cluster. It's 120 stars, uh, which uh, many of them are type Bs. That means they're hot and blue. Think of a blowtorch, the hottest part of the flame is blue. Um, the brightest star is a type K, which is an orange and cooler than the sun. So there's a little arrow pointing to it. So if you can find that, those bright blue stars in the, uh, in the uh, orange one, <laughs> you're there. That's 94.2 million years old, 1,590 light years from us, and up there is the uh, location. But from the tail, tail of the scorpion, it should be fairly easy to find. Okay, now we're going to M28 and Sagittarius. All right, so everybody's familiar with the teapot. House Borealis, I've never heard of that one, but that must be the in the very top of the dome with the teapot lid. And this little bit from that is M28. It's a magnitude 7.7 .7 globular star cluster. And there's a picture of it. M to C naked eye. And those, we're going to zoom in here. There it is. Really nice picture. It's 17,900 light years distant and 12 billion years old. So it's almost as old as the, uh, and it has over 50,000 stars. So it's almost as old as the uh, universe. First cluster to found to contain a millisecond pulsar. PSR 8. Uh, B1821-24. Very dense, highly magnetic neutron star spinning its axis with a three millisecond period. That means the point of the equator is moving over 75 million miles an hour. I kind of wonder how it can stay together at that speed. Okay, and there's the location on it and right ascension and, and declination, but it should be easy to spot and find. And transits at midnight on July the 22nd. Okay, M8, the Lagoon Nebula. I know a lot of people have seen this. They're always showing it at star parties. So you go to the spout, go northwest about six degrees. And you can kind of see a kind of bright little gathering of stars right there. And there it is. Very large emission nebula and the H hydrogen 2, or II, however you want to put it, star forming region in Sagittarius. It's magnitude 6 and it's 4,100 light years distance. It's an open star cluster, NCG 6530, is down here in the kind of the lower left corner. So some think it's easier to see that than the nebula itself. And it's closer, 
poses extremely young, hot O-type stars that ionize and light up the entire nebula. And they burn through their typo, burn through their hydrogen at a fierce rate, ending as a supernova after only a few million years. Wow. It's also famous for its Bach globules, which are dark collapsing clouds. I think that's what these little, oh, you can't see that. Um, a protostellar material, each some 10,000 astronomical units in diameter. I don't know where my pointer is here. And, well, they're being circled there. I mean, they're kind of obvious. Hmm. Note the dark nebula that gives M8 its name, the Lagoon Nebula. Kind of looks like a big lagoon. And the Hourglass Nebula, the brightest part is over here. I don't think that's that obvious, but uh, if you're looking through a telescope, you might see it. There's a close-up of it. Oh yeah, okay, now I see it. It's the only active star-forming region I know of not completely hidden by dense dust clouds. A lot of the interesting things to see in the Lagoon Nebula, the more you look, the more you will find. I know it's very popular, just look at it and at star shows. And then you can really magnify it because it's so nice and bright. And if you use a nebula filter, it helps. There's the location of it. And it's fairly up there, 24 degrees up at midnight on July the 3rd. Okay, now we're going to the Triffid Nebula, M20. Uh, that's another popular one. And you go from M8. And it's about uh, straight up, uh, about one and a half degrees. And it's called the Triffid. Triffid by the uh, shape of it. It's an open star cluster, emission nebula, reflection nebula, and a dark nebula that causes a trifurcated uh, appearance. Its magnitude 6.3 is about 4,100 light years distance. And the central star lighting the entire nebula is a triple star system. The brightest member, which is a type 07.5 triple I. And it has about 3,100 stars in it. Okay, we're gonna zoom in on it here. Okay, so that little thing there is three quarters of a light year long. And it's a jet, and there's a young stellar object deep within the clouds still becoming a star. And that's a picture taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a good picture. And it says it's rather than likely you can see it with the 16 inch telescope. This is about what you'll see. You can still see the triffid, but you don't see the details within it. There's the location. And midnight July 2nd, it's at 25 degrees. Up. Okay, we're going to M21, an open star cluster in Sagittarius. It's a rather dense open cluster, just 40 degrees northeast of M20. So you can see kind of a bright blob if you're looking through the eyepiece. And the cluster's magnitude is 6.5, 4250 light years away. 
and contains over 100 stars, some bright, some faint. And this is for the spectroscope guys. Eight of the 10 brightest are spectroscopic binaries with periods of less than six days. And it's only 4.6 million years old. And there's the location there. And on July the 18th, it'll be 26 degrees up. Okay, and now we're going to M23 and Sagittarius. Okay, from Kraus Borealis, that's the tip of the teapot there. You go five, a little over five degrees north. And then you go northwest, four degrees, to uh, M23, <laughs> which is three degrees north of M21. And at the apex, another Christmas tree-shaped triangle. So these little triangles make it much easier to find stuff. And here's, here's a picture of it. It's magnitude 6.9, 2,150 light years away. I'm not sure most people would recognize that looking through a telescope unless they're very experienced. It's 220 million years old. It's one of the older open clusters in the Milky Way. It has 176 stars in a six or eight inch telescope will resolve dozens of the cluster stars. Note all the red stars in the clusters. They must either be small stars that never had enough mass to become hotter, or they're very much larger stars that have used up their hydrogen. So they're either very young or very old. And they might become red supergiants. And their temperature is also known from their color. And then with that, you can determine their mass and size. But someone else can do the math. <laughs> okay, in the foreground is HD 16332245. It's not part of the cluster, it's 6.52 light magnitude 6.52, and it's only 320 light years away. And it's up 29 degrees on July the 1st. Well, actually 29 and a half at midnight. Okay, M16, the Eagle Nebula, another popular one. So you go back to Moon Sagittarius. And you just go north about uh, two and a quarter degrees. Magnitude 6.3, so it should stand out. Continue north another one degree, and that's magnitude 5.78. And then you go north again to HD 16.84.15, magnitude 5.37. You go north again, another two degrees to M16 Eagle Nebula. <coughs> and there's a nice picture of it. And you can see why they call it the Eagle Nebula. And it's the Mission Nebula about 7,000 light years away. Composed of at least 450 stars is 5.5 million years old. Alrighty, Pillars of Creation. This is uh, the Hubble Space Telescope photograph, central portion of M16 called the Pillars of Creation. Those pillars have active stars forming within it. And it's been famous from t-shirts to coffee mugs. I've seen them around. 
and the largest one, which is over on the left, is uh, four to five light years long, which is a difference of about the distance from Earth to Alpha Centauri. It takes at least a 12 inch telescope to see it. You won't see it through binoculars. We should be able to see it through our 16, I would think. Okay, and it says a little explanation of how the ultraviolet radiation is uh, um, trying to heat it up there. Okay, and it's fairly high, 35 degrees on July the 7th at midnight. Okay, M17 in Sagittarius. Again, from the tip of the uh, Sagittarius teapot, go north five and a quarter degrees to move Sagittarius. We've been there before. And then go kind of northeast five degrees to M17. And it's just 22 minutes southeast of HD 168415. And so is the Omega Nebula or the Checkmark Nebula or the Swan Nebula. I've never heard it called either. I've always heard it called the Omega Nebula. Nebula is magnitude 6.0, it's naked eye. It's considered one of the largest and brightest, some 5,500 light years distance. Okay, it contains very young, one million year old open cluster stars. Uh, NCG 6618 is composed of some 800 stars. So it's a fairly young grouping. But they can only 35, which are very hot, but you can only see them in infrared. And it's saying that 168, 625 may be part of this cluster. It's a bright, bright blue hypergiant star and forms a visual pair with 168, 607, another blue hyper giant. They lose mass at high rate, though, with their very strong stellar wind. And you'll see down at the bottom there where they're located. Okay, 168625 is surrounded by a nebula similar to that around a progenitor of SN1987A, suggesting that it too could become a supernova soon. I don't know if you remember 1987, when that was big news that the star went nova, supernova. And 32 degrees up on midnight on July the 7th. Okay, M18, Black Swan Cluster. I have never heard of this one. Small and dim. It's the hardest M object in this part of the sky to find. Go from M17, just go south 58 minutes to M18. So that should be fairly easy to find, except it's dim. Sparse contain only about 20 stars. That should make it very difficult. Magnitude 7.5, definitely not naked eyes, 4,900 light years distance and 32 million years old. And the brightest star is 168.352 with a magnitude of 8.65. Doesn't look like it in this photograph, but it, that's a fairly dim star. And there's the location in right ascension and declination. And 31 degrees up when it transit, transits on July the 7th at midnight. Okay, we're going to M24, Sagittarius 
cloud. There's a in the oval there. So from a, M18, you go southwest two degrees, makes about three degrees southwest of M17. Its magnitude is 4.6, is actually a 600 light year wide gap in the nearby obscurity dust cloud. And this allows you to see the stars in Sagittarius arm of the Milky Way, which is the next inner spiral arm for our galaxy. 10,000 to 16,000 light years distance. Pack a lunch, it may take a while to get there. And there's the location. It's 30 degrees up at midnight on July the 6th. Looks like on this part of the sky, July is time to be out looking for them. Next target is M25 and Sagittarius. So we're back to the teapot. Again, the tip of the teapot, so five degrees north, been there before. And forms a triangle and moves Sagittarius. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's magnitude 4.9 open cluster. In this picture, it's 2,000 light years away. In this picture, it might be kind of hard to uh, pick out from the background. 601 stars, 67.6 million years old. An eight inch telescope will resolve about 60 stars. And on July the 10th, has an altitude of 29 and a half degrees at midnight. And the last one coming up is M22 in Sagittarius. Okay, back to the teapot. From the tip of the teapot, Go northeast to a quarter degrees to M22. Magnitude 5.5, tightly packed globular cluster star cluster. Um, that should be fairly easy to pick out, I would think. It's 10,600 light years distance and 12 billion years old. And it's, it's composed of some of the oldest stars known and contains two stellar mass black holes. <laughs> the Hubble Space Telescope has detected planetary nebula and six planetary sized objects, not orbiting stars. They're rogue planets. If they are gas giants, they may be called sub-brown dwarfs. And there's the right ascension and declination. But actually, star hopping should be fairly easy to find. As an altitude of 25 degrees at midnight on July the 11th. Okay, I don't know. Dick, do you have any flash drives for this program, or I'll just give it to. Uh, um, Jim and he can post it on on the uh, site where we keep all this stuff. It'd be better if he posts it. All right, I'll do that. All righty. Well, Dick, thanks for the program. It was very interesting. But I think it's one of those ones you gotta uh, bring up and kind of scrutinize a little more. So let me see if I can get out of here. There we go. Uh, your screen sharing. I want to stop screen sharing. Uh, I've got a comment here. Oh, go ahead. 
I think this is uh, one of the best star hoppings that you've done. Thank uh, you. I definitely want one of those uh, flash drives. Oh yeah, I'm with you. I think it makes it very easy to find this stuff because you're only dealing with yeah, you know, Scorpius and Sagittarius, and everything's coming right off of there. So that should make it really easy. Share. All right, we're back. So thanks, Dick. I found it very interesting. And I'll probably go through a few more times because I like to get out and observe in the summertime. I'm not really an observing the wintertime person. You know, I like the cold weather. I don't care for cold weather. I never go out in the wintertime. Well, I used to work I outside. Have a hard time finding Orion Nebula because I'm, I'm never outside in the winter time. Well, I used to work outside in cold weather. I was on a on line crew, so cold weather doesn't really bother me that much. But you know, it's always it's always a hassle because your optics want to fog over and stuff. Hey, Amen to that. All righty. It's a, a nice relevant uh, program, Dick, because uh, it's kind of our main subject matter through the majority of our viewing season. And, uh, you know, those targets are the ones that we always go to. And uh, it's kind of nice to see, especially for, for those people, very few get up uh, before sunrise. About a couple of weeks here in March, you can always see, uh, it's always a fun thing to see the uh, Scorpius tail coming above the horizon in the east. So. I work very hard at being sure I do not get up before sunrise. 